Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named American Horror Stories Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled Lake, begins with a group of young people who are visiting a renowned tourist attraction, Lake Prescott. Jake found information online that there was once a human village beneath the lake's surface. In a sudden burst of curiosity, he wanted to go down and explore. The others found it too boring, but Jake's sister, Finn, decided to join her brother for the adventure. Once they were ready, the siblings plunged into the water. In recent years, due to drought, the water level had dropped significantly. The two soon reached the lake bed, but at first, they didn't discover anything. They resurfaced to catch their breath, and then went on to explore other areas. This time, they finally found a small, three-wheeled vehicle. As more and more traces of life appeared, they realized that the rumors online were true. While the siblings were excited, suddenly a hand grabbed Jake's leg. Finn rushed to help, but couldn't budge him no matter how hard she tried. She had no choice but to swim to the surface and call for help. By the time Finn returned, she saw her brother being pulled away by a tremendous force, disappearing without a trace. Four months later, Finn was brought back home by her parents. After her brother's tragic death, she was diagnosed with severe depression and had just completed treatment. Returning home, Finn glanced at Jake's photo and silently retreated to her room. Her mother, still concerned, wanted to spend as much time with her daughter as possible. Finn, who was hospitalized at the time, had not attended Jake's funeral. She was curious about what was in Jake's coffin. Her mother explained that since Jake's body was never found, they could only place his favorite items in the coffin. However, Finn firmly believed that her brother's death was not that simple. She had seen everything clearly at the time. Her mother burst into tears, realizing that her daughter's depression was far from cured. After settling Finn, her mother returned to her room and saw her husband engrossed in his work. She then went to the bathroom to run the water for a bath. But she quickly noticed that something was wrong. The water in the bathtub had become incredibly murky. Then, a black hand emerged. The mother barely managed to shake it off and looked back at the bathtub, only to find the water had returned to its original clarity. It seemed like everything she just witnessed was an illusion. The mother felt that there was more to the story. Recalling Finn's description of the strange events, she began to research the haunted rumors surrounding Prescott Lake. As night fell, Finn, who was sound asleep like a pig, was suddenly awakened by a horrifying nightmare. At the same time, her mother mysteriously opened her eyes. She faintly heard the sound of running water and searched curiously, finding that the kitchen faucet had been left on. But as soon as she turned it off, it turned back on by itself. Then a loud noise came from outside the yard. The mother rushed out to see that the swimming pool's switch had also been turned on. The series of strange events made her shudder. When the mother finished tidying up and was preparing to return to her room to sleep, she suddenly felt the water from the pool rising. Then, she heard her deceased son's voice coming from behind her, asking her to go find him. Although the figure disappeared in a flash, the mother was sure she hadn't seen it wrong. She believed her son wanted to come home, so she decided to return to Prescott Lake to recover his body. Finn's father opposed the idea, arguing that the police divers had searched for weeks without finding anything. He questioned her ability to find their son and left for work without looking back. The mother stood by the window, watching her husband leave, unsure of what to do. Finn had eavesdropped on her parents' argument and came out. She believed that what her mother saw was not an illusion, just like the strange events she had witnessed herself. She decided to join her mother in searching for Jake's body. Although the mother was worried about Finn's depression relapsing, Finn calmly stated that perhaps only by finding her brother could her condition completely improve. The mother and daughter quickly packed their bags and set off by car. That afternoon, Finn and her mother arrived at their lakeside villa near the lake. The mother recalled the happy times the family of four had spent there, but things had changed since Jake's accident, and they hadn't stayed there since. Early the next morning, Finn drove a speedboat, taking her mother to the place where Jake had his accident. This time, for safety reasons, the mother had bought a safety rope. If she didn't come up after a few minutes underwater, Finn would pull the rope up forcefully. With everything prepared, the mother, tied to the safety rope, jumped into the water. After swimming around the lake without finding anything unusual, she couldn't help but wonder if her daughter had remembered it wrong. However, Finn was absolutely certain, saying that just a bit further ahead, they would see a three-wheeled vehicle. When the mother went underwater for the second time, she indeed saw the three-wheeler Finn had mentioned, which boosted her confidence. After several breaths, the mother finally discovered three bodies tied to a concrete block, but they were too old to be Jake's. Curious, the mother pulled off a tag from one of the corpses and prepared to swim back to the surface. 
Suddenly, her leg was grabbed by a hand. Finn, on the boat, felt the rope trembling and quickly pulled it with all her might. At that moment, the hand holding the mother loosened its grip. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be Jake, who had long been lifeless. Afterward, many police officers arrived at the scene, and Jake's body was retrieved. The sheriff exclaimed that it was nothing short of a miracle, as they had searched for the mother for weeks without success, yet she had managed to accomplish it in just a few hours. The whole situation seemed strange, but she didn't want to dwell on it. She casually showed the tag she had pulled from the chained body to the sheriff, who recognized the emblem belonged to the Boone family. Before the area became a lake, several families lived here, and the Boone family was one of them. There was still one descendant living in the small town. The mother wanted to ask more questions, but Finn's father called, furious about their unannounced departure. However, upon hearing that they had found their son's body, he was shocked and said he would come over later. Finn had sustained some minor injuries on her palm from pulling the rope, but compared to the discovery of her brother's body, it was nothing serious. The mother, having just experienced the strange events at the bottom of the lake, finally believed her daughter's words and felt there must be more to her brother's death. While the police were examining Jake's body, the mother decided to investigate further. They quickly found the descendant of the Boone family and showed her the emblem, asking about its origin. The old lady recognized it as the one her grandfather had worn. It turned out that several decades ago, a businessman came to the area and built dams everywhere for hydroelectric power, profiting from it. The local families refused to cooperate and tried to impede the businessman's plans. However, the businessman simply captured the residents who caused trouble, including the grandfather of the Boone family. Instead of killing them outright, he chained them to concrete blocks. Due to the dams, the water level in the lake began to rise slowly, eventually submerging the surrounding villages, along with the people who were tied up. Ninety years had passed since the dam was built, and every year local residents would petition together, accusing the businessmen of his crimes during the dam's construction. However, these efforts always ended in vain. Before his death, the businessman left a large sum of money to hire a law firm to fend off all accusations against the dam. Finn couldn't understand why he would do this after his death. The old lady explained that dismantling the dam would cause the floodwaters to recede and expose the businessman's crimes to the public, affecting his family's reputation. Finn's mother asked which law firm could be so unscrupulous. Upon hearing the answer, Finn was stunned because this was the very law firm where her father worked. The mother didn't want to create any more trouble, so she prepared to pack up and head home that night. Just then, the father arrived at the lakeside villa by car. The mother asked her husband if he knew that the said businessman he defended was an unforgivable villain. Finn's father didn't see it that way, arguing that if it weren't for this wealthy client, they wouldn't have their house and even the lakeside villa. The mother felt that something was off, as she believed the villa had been passed down from her husband's family. Finn immediately caught on, wondering if her father was a descendant of the businessman. Her father admitted that the businessman was his great-grandfather. He believed his family hadn't done anything wrong. Although some people were hurt during the construction, the lake became a famous tourist attraction and created more business value. But Finn's mother was shocked by the revelation and slumped onto the bed as she realized the businessman had killed too many people and the vengeful spirits had killed his descendants, including her son Jake. This made Finn worry that they might come for her as well. The father couldn't stand his wife and daughter's ramblings and decided to pack up and leave immediately. But just then, the lights in the room went out and even the phone lost its signal. The mother looked outside in terror, only to see desiccated corpses emerging from the lake. They were all vengeful spirits seeking retribution. Finn's family barely escaped the villa, only to be surrounded by the mummified corpses. The father finally believed his wife's words, but it was too late. He charged into the crowd of corpses, urging his wife and daughter to leave quickly. Finn wanted to save him, but her mother held her tight. It wasn't long before the mummified corpses lifted Finn's father above their heads, taking him to the bottom of the lake. Finn cried her heart out on the shore, while her mother remained eerily calm. She finally realized that the vengeful spirits had planned this for a long time, from Jake's death to her hallucinations, just to lure Finn's father here and fulfill their purpose of revenge. The second story, titled Dollhouse, begins with a woman named Kobe, a top student from a prestigious university dressed up especially for the occasion. She arrived for an interview at the largest toy company. After a few simple questions, the company's boss, a tycoon, announced that she was not the right fit for this position. Little did Kobe know, her interview journey was far from over. When she regained consciousness, she found herself in a room filled with toys. 
The tycoon announced that a beauty pageant would be held, and Kobe was infuriated by the situation she found herself in. She immediately stood up to leave, but the burly man with a hook at the door quickly changed her mind. The tycoon warned her that escaping through the door or window would be futile, and that the only way out was a single path. Kobe didn't give up just yet, but after trying all doors and windows, she still couldn't find an opportunity to escape. Just as she was cursing her luck, the dolls in the room suddenly moved. To her surprise, they were all played by real people who were winners of the beauty pageant and would become the tycoon's wives. Kobe, who had joined halfway through and didn't care for the title of the tycoon's wife, was more concerned with finding a way out. The other contestants urged her to give up, claiming that the place was completely sealed off. Despairingly, Kobe looked out the window and saw a little boy on the opposite balcony who was also staring at her. A chilling sensation ran through her. A kind-hearted chubby girl tried to console Kobe, saying that the beauty pageant might not be a bad thing after all. It turned out that the wealthy boss's wife had been thrown into a dried-up well due to infidelity, and now he needed not only a new spouse, but also a good mother for his child. As the alarm on the wall rang, the chubby girl hurriedly reminded Kobe that a new round of testing was about to begin. All contestants had to disguise themselves as dolls, unable to speak or move voluntarily. Kobe quickly chose a clown costume. Soon, the wealthy boss entered with his son. This was an appetizer before the official contest. If the contestants could win the little boy's affection, it could earn them extra points. The child seemed to love the new toys his father had prepared, but as soon as he left, the boy showed his true colors. He planned to throw Kobe, disguised as a clown, into the well. However, Kobe had a hidden trick up her sleeve. She somehow made a toy car move by itself, intriguing the boy who asked her to demonstrate again. Everyone watched the toy car intently, while Kobe stared wide-eyed, as if using telekinesis. The toy car moved again, astonishing everyone. Kobe explained that it was a trick she had learned from her magician uncle, which successfully piqued the boy's interest. Consequently, some contestants began to harbor animosity towards Kobe, especially the duo dressed in black and white, who were determined to become the tycoon's wife. Kobe scoffed at this, knowing that the tycoon was far from normal and being his wife would only lead to misery. Just as the alarm on the wall rang again, everyone hurried out to prepare. Little did they know, the dolls seated around the dining table were actually played by real people. This was a life-or-death beauty pageant. The rules were simple. Set the tableware according to aristocratic etiquette, and scores would be given on the spot when the time was up. The contestant with the lowest score would be eliminated. Upon the tycoon's command, all the competitors started arranging the tableware. Kobe was at a complete loss and could only secretly observe the duo dressed in black and white, imitating their every move. Just as the countdown was about to end, the black and white duo suddenly switched the positions of their spoons. Caught off guard, Kobe accidentally knocked over her cup. Unfortunately, time was up and she had no chance to make it up. The tycoon, acting as the judge, began to evaluate one by one. The black and white duo scored full marks with their perfect arrangement, while others received deductions. When it was Kobe's turn, several blatant mistakes cost her four points. It seemed inevitable that she would be eliminated. However, when the judge came to the last contestant, he flew into a rage. Her countless errors led to all her points being taken away. Without a doubt, this contestant was eliminated, and everyone watched as she was thrown into a dried-up well with a hook. The cruelty of the competition was beyond imagination. Realizing this, Kobe put in extra effort to showcase her magic, and her relationship with the little boy grew closer. Through their conversations, she learned that the boy was also pitiful. He was often ridiculed by his classmates for liking dolls and had to stay home all the time. Feeling lonely and deprived of maternal love, he expressed his desire for Kobe to become his mother. As time went by, the second round of the beauty pageant arrived. This time, the challenge was to mix a fragrant spray and iron a shirt. The countdown began, and everyone busied themselves, mixing potions and folding clothes. There was no homework to copy this time, so Kobe had to improvise. The contest ended quickly, and the tycoon began scoring. The chubby girl's spray was too strong, costing her three points. When it was Kobe's turn, everyone was shocked to see that she had burnt the shirt. However, the tycoon didn't disqualify her. Instead, he asked Kobe to extend her hand and placed the scorching hot iron on it. Kobe endured the pain without uttering a chicken scream. 
The tycoon then went to the black and white duo, unable to find any faults after looking for a long time. When he came to the last contestant, he simply picked up her shirt, took a whiff, and immediately declared the smell too unpleasant, deducting all her points. As a result, she was eliminated, and waiting for her was the same dry, deep well. Now, only three contestants remained. The tycoon announced that the grand finale would be held the following day, and the ultimate winner would be determined. The chubby girl was visibly panicked, having no confidence in her chances of victory. In contrast, the black and white duo displayed anger. Kobe should have been eliminated in the previous round. Perhaps the tycoon knew of her relationship with his son and chose to show favoritism. This caused the black and white duo to feel an immense sense of crisis. One of them ventured into the hall alone and began closely examining the toy car, attempting to break the magic that Kobe had supposedly conjured. Unfortunately, she found no flaws even after a long time. Left with no choice, she decided to risk everything. If Kobe were gone, she could become the ultimate winner. The madwoman, brandishing sharp screws, began to stab the doll dressed as a clown, but Kobe remained unharmed, and instead of growing angry, she offered to help everyone escape. She had already devised a plan. As night fell, the final round of the beauty pageant began. The tycoon arrived at the hall and began reading the rules to the dolls. However, the real contestants were hiding behind the curtains. Seeing the tycoon enter, they quickly opened the door to escape the mansion. The tycoon had not yet noticed anything amiss, making it the perfect opportunity to flee. However, Kobe insisted that it was not yet time to leave, as she wanted to take the little boy with her. Leaving him with his abnormal father would only spell doom on him. The other two disagreed with her and chose to go their separate ways. Kobe silently headed to the boy's location. After explaining her intentions to the boy, Kobe extended her hand in invitation. But the boy struck her suddenly, causing her to lose consciousness. On the other hand, the tycoon discovered that the dolls were not real people. Before he could initiate a pursuit, the black and white duo started fighting with the chubby girl, blaming her for making too much noise. They decided to take care of her before escaping on their own. Unexpectedly, the hook-wielding pursuer caught up quickly, efficiently eliminating both of them with a single shot each. However, Kobe's fate was not much better. Her body was fixed to an experimental table, and the tycoon proudly revealed that all the dolls in the room had been fitted with sound transmitters. It turned out Kobe's plan had been exposed from the beginning, yet the tycoon did not intervene, treating this escape attempt as the final test. He was surprised by Kobe's concern for his son. As a result, she passed the test, becoming the ultimate winner. However, the tycoon believed that Kobe was still one step away from being the perfect mother. He decided to help her by giving her a complete makeover. Kobe guessed that something terrible was about to happen, and her body began to tremble uncontrollably. Accompanied by a miserable scream, a human-shaped mold slowly descended, gradually covering Kobe's body. The scene shifted to the tycoon and his son sitting cheerfully on the sofa. The lady of the house was serving them tea and water, but Kobe's appearance had changed beyond recognition. Just then, two women dressed as witches suddenly burst in. With a wave of their arms, everyone froze on the spot. Kobe's skin began to crack, revealing that the tycoon's so-called makeover was actually a layer of ceramic skin. The witches told Kobe that she was one of them and wanted to take her away. But Kobe hadn't forgotten about the poor little boy and took him with her as she left. With a wave of their hands, the witches turned the tycoon's mansion into a blazing inferno. Three days later, Kobe seemed to have adjusted to her witch identity. It's revealed that the magic she used was real. The little boy now had a new name and was staying at an elite girls school under Kobe's care, embarking on another magical adventure. The third story, titled Aura, begins with Jazlyn, a woman in fat, moving into a new house and buying a brand new video doorbell. Bryce, her husband in muscle, thought it was a waste since the community had strict security measures. However, Jazlyn had a good reason for buying it. When she was young, she carelessly let a stranger in, leading to a robber entering and killing both her parents. Understanding his wife's trauma, Bryce stopped criticizing and installed the doorbell himself. As long as someone approached the door, audio and video would automatically be transmitted to their phone. Bryce tested it, and the results were impressive. Jaslyn felt completely at ease. Her husband often worked late and traveled, while she was a full-time craft live streamer, frequently home alone. One night, the doorbell sensor sent a signal to Jaslyn's phone. She opened the video and saw nobody at the door. She opened the door and looked around, only to find that a stray cat had triggered the sensor. Jaslyn locked the door and prepared to wash up and sleep when her phone suddenly received another signal. 
Opening the video, she saw a disheveled old man repeatedly asking to enter. Jazeline panicked and shouted for him to leave, but he ignored her and even tried to force the door open. Unable to sit still, Jazlyn called the police. Before long, her husband rushed back in his car and police sirens flashed red and blue outside their door. Jazlyn was giving her statement, but the old man had vanished without a trace. At that moment, a neighbor from across the street said their garage camera had captured the situation at Jazlyn's door and might provide useful clues. To everyone's surprise, no one had approached Jazlyn's door from the start of the incident until the police arrived. She reviewed the doorbell video and didn't see the old man again. The police concluded that Jazlyn had experienced a hallucination, offered some comforting words, and left. Even Bryce thought his wife was overthinking and told her to sleep instead of dwelling on it. But Jazlyn knew that what she had seen was definitely not an illusion. The next day, the couple were sitting on the sofa, watching TV and learning, when the ringtone of their phone sounded again. The disheveled old man had appeared once more. This time, Jazlyn became excited, finally able to prove to her husband that she was right. Bryce was taken aback and hurriedly asked the old man what he wanted. The man kept repeating that he wanted to see his wife, Jazlyn. Bryce became furious and was about to open the door to confront the man when Jazlyn shouted not to open it. Bryce thought better of it, realizing that there might be danger outside, so he called their neighbor across the street to check the situation at their front door. But Bryce was soon dumbfounded. There clearly stood a strange old man at their door, yet the neighbor's security camera showed no sign of anyone. The situation was too bizarre. Jazlyn was about to call the police when she noticed the old man at the door had disappeared. Her husband quickly opened the door to check, and sure enough, there was no one there. Bryce thought the only explanation was someone playing a prank by hacking their security system. But Jaslyn argued that she had felt someone pushing the door yesterday. Her husband didn't want to discuss the matter further, and suggested Jaslyn search online to see if there were similar pranks. The next morning, Jaslyn searched the internet for similar incidents involving their video doorbell model. Suddenly, a bunch of videos appeared of strangers knocking on doors and then disappearing. Bryce kept reassuring her that if they restarted the system and changed the password, no one would be able to hack in again. But Jaslyn still felt uneasy. She remembered a janitor from her high school days who looked a lot like the old man. At the time, she had merely greeted him, but the janitor became infatuated with her and even secretly gave her love letters. He didn't resurface until after he retired. Bryce didn't take it seriously, thinking the old man's appearance was a figment of Jaslyn's imagination based on her high school experience. But Jaslyn couldn't put her mind at ease, and even saw the old man's figure when she was home alone. Unable to sit still any longer, she drove to the vicinity of her old high school and, using her vague memory, found the janitor's house. Under the pretext of organizing a school reunion, she wanted to inquire about his recent situation. As it turned out, the janitor had been living with his sister since retiring, but he had suddenly gone missing a few months ago. Jaslyn became nervous, especially when she saw a recent photo of him that looked exactly like the one she had seen on the video. Fuming, she rushed home, now certain that the man at the door these past few days had been the janitor. She was about to call the police when her phone received another doorbell signal. Opening it, she saw that the janitor had indeed returned. He kept saying he wanted to come in and meet her. Fortunately, it was daytime, so Jaslyn wasn't as scared as before. She mustered her courage and unlocked the door, but there was still no one outside. Jaslyn nervously looked around, feeling a chill pass by her. Afterward, she quickly locked the door again, but as she turned around, she was frightened to see the janitor standing in the living room. Luckily, the man didn't seem to have any ill intentions, so Jaslyn gradually calmed down. The janitor said he had been feeling guilty all these years for harassing her during high school and had come to ask for her forgiveness. Jaslyn was moved by his words and admitted that she hadn't understood the situation back then and shouldn't have mocked him. As soon as she finished speaking, the man became emotional. He nodded gratefully and then disappeared into a cloud of dust. Just then, a news report came on the TV, saying that the janitor had been missing for two months and his body had been found under an overpass. Jaslyn realized that what she had seen before was the janitor's ghost, seeking to fulfill his last wish. Thankfully, it had been resolved and Jaslyn could finally relax. However, as she was about to tell her husband about the incident, her phone received another security notification. Upon checking the video feed, they saw a pale woman standing at their door. The woman introduced herself as Mary and said she remembered being in a park and now wanted to come in and find someone. Bryce quickly grabbed the phone and yelled for the prankster to stop. 
Jaslyn wanted to take another look, but the woman had already disappeared. Bryce couldn't take it anymore, so he removed the doorbell camera, saying he never wanted to use it again. But Jaslyn believed there was more to the story. She drove to the park mentioned by the woman and found a memorial plaque with Mary's name on it on a bench. She then searched the name on the internet, and as it turned out, Mary had died in a car accident near the park years ago, and the hit-and-run driver had been caught and sentenced. Jaslyn couldn't figure out why Mary came to their house, and the only possibility was that she knew her husband, Bryce. At first, Bryce denied knowing her, but Jaslyn showed him a video explaining that this new type of doorbell camera was built with a novel technology that could detect every pixel and even the energy fields of the wandering souls. Bryce dismissed it as nonsense, but he couldn't deny it anymore when Mary reappeared. Unexpectedly, Jaslyn had reinstalled the doorbell camera and Bryce could no longer pretend. Frustrated, he admitted that Mary was his former fiancé. They had argued in the park years ago and decided to break up. Bryce left in his car, but Mary suffered a car accident on her way home. Jaslyn believed that Mary's spirit had returned to seek Bryce's forgiveness, so she opened the door, but Mary was nowhere to be seen. When Jaslyn returned to the living room, she found Mary standing there, holding a ghostly child. Bryce panicked and finally revealed the truth from years ago. At that time, Mary was pregnant with Bryce's child and wanted to have the baby, but Bryce wasn't ready to be a father. They fought, and during the struggle, Mary was hit by a passing car. Bryce watched the driver flee without showing any concern, then walked slowly to the injured Mary. Instead of calling for help, he stomped on her, killing her. Jaslyn couldn't believe this was true. Bryce no longer pretended and was prepared to silence Jaslyn by killing her. He picked up a golf club and menacingly approached her, but before he could act, he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his neck and fell to the ground, bleeding profusely. Jaslyn realized that Mary hadn't appeared to seek forgiveness, but to seek revenge. Three months later, Jaslyn had moved into a new house. To her surprise, the landlord had installed the latest video doorbell there. Jaslyn suddenly had a bad feeling, and sure enough, in the middle of the night, her phone received another doorbell signal. Curiously, she opened the video and saw Bryce, who was now dead, knocking at her door. The fourth story, titled Drive, begins with a hedonistic woman named Marcy, who indulges herself at nightclubs almost every night. Today, she happened to meet a handsome man. When he approached her for a drink, Marcy knew that it would be a beautiful night. Just moments ago, they were dancing passionately on the dance floor, and now they were in the car, getting intimate and smelly. Two minutes later, as expected, they finished their intimacy, and Marcy felt disappointed, so she urged the two-minute man to leave the car. As Marcy drove home, she noticed a car following her. Initially, she didn't think much of it, but the other driver began honking the horn and flashing the headlights non-stop. Marcy wondered if it was the two-minute man from earlier seeking revenge. She stepped on the gas, trying to shake him off, but to her surprise, the other car crashed into her. Now Marcy was truly panicked. It was clear that this was more than mere provocation. Fortunately, a crossroads appeared ahead, and Marcy made a sudden turn, driving onto another road and hiding in a car wash. After turning off the engine, she finally managed to lose the pursuer. Marcy sighed with relief. Upon returning home, still shaken, she complained to her husband about encountering a lunatic, but it was too dark for her to see the other driver's license plate. Worried, her husband felt that he had to accompany Marcy when she went out to have fun from now on. However, she rejected the idea, insisting on complete freedom. Her husband became gentle, brushing aside Marcy's long hair to reveal a face full of birthmarks, which he believed to be her most beautiful feature. He expressed that a married couple should share everything, and then they fell asleep together. At around 3 a.m., Marcy was awakened by a dripping sound. She feared that the two-minute man had tracked her down. Silently, she got up and began inspecting the house. She checked the front door and found no problems, then moved on to the side door without finding any issues. The dripping sound continued, so she went to the basement and finally discovered the sound came from an open ventilation window. However, a shadow appeared behind her, and when the light shone on it, she realized it was her husband who had just woken up. Marcy, relieved by the false alarm, yelled for them to go back to sleep. The next morning, Marcy wasted no time telling her best friend about being followed the night before. Her friend perked up and told her that several people had gone missing after leaving nightclubs recently. Their encounters eerily resembled Marcy's experience, with cars tailing and even crashing into them. Although the victims managed to shake off the pursuing cars, it turned out that the real culprits were not the drivers, but killers hiding in the back seats. The pursuing cars were actually trying to warn the victims. Marcy's observant friend noticed that one of the missing people looked somewhat similar to the two-minute man Marcy met the previous night. 
she advised Marcy never to let strangers into her car again. That evening, Marcy ended up having some smelly time again in her car, but this time with a woman. Her friend, displeased by this, felt that Marcy was beyond help. However, Marcy argued that she had followed her friend's advice and hadn't let a man into her car. The two had a heated argument, but Marcy remained undaunted and returned to the nightclub to find new targets. To her surprise, she encountered her husband there, who claimed he wanted to protect Marcy's safety. This irritated Marcy, feeling that her life was being monitored. She angrily drove her husband away, but she lost interest in continuing her night out. As Marcy prepared to drive home, she noticed a familiar car parked nearby, the same car that had followed her the day before. She was about to approach and take a photo of the license plate when she saw a man walking towards her. Marcy quickly returned to her car. Fortunately, she was fast enough, and the man turned out to be the owner of the suspicious car. Watching him drive away, Marcy silently followed and finally noted the license plate number. She went home and searched the internet for information on the owner, who turned out to be a man named Paul. But no home address was available. At that moment, her husband made an ill-timed appearance, expressing concerns about their relationship and deciding to move out in a few days. Marcy, however, didn't attempt to change his mind, as her attention was focused on Paul, the man who had followed her. By searching social media photos, Marcy quickly identified his workplace. Driven by her curiosity, she visited the store pretending to be a customer. It was a kitchenware shop where Paul worked as a salesperson. He didn't seem like a good person, aggressively promoting new knives. Feeling scared, Marcy excused herself, saying she didn't like cooking. However, Paul suggested using the knife against her husband, further convincing Marcy that he was not a normal person. She quickly made up an excuse to leave the shop but couldn't let it go. Marcy waited for Paul to finish work and followed him to his apartment, hoping to further confirm whether he was the serial killer mentioned in the news. While Paul went to the bathroom for a shower, Marcy stealthily sneaked into his home. When she saw the knives he had been selling during the day, she couldn't help but shudder. She grabbed one for self-defense and proceeded into Paul's bedroom. Upon seeing the wall covered in news reports of missing people, she hurriedly took out her phone to take pictures. But Paul finished his shower and stepped out of the bathroom, causing Marcy to panic and hide under the table. She waited until he got dressed and left the room before slowly standing up. However, Paul returned unexpectedly, leading to a standoff between them. Not wanting to be mistaken for a thief, Marcy explained her reason for being there and asked why he had followed her the night before, flashing his high beams. Paul recalled the incident and they realized that it had all been a misunderstanding. Going back to the night before, Paul had just left the bar and was about to head home when he spotted a figure in the back seat of Marcy's car, which she seemed unaware of. He quickly pursued her in his car, thinking of the serial killer mentioned in recent news reports. He honked his horn repeatedly to warn her, but Marcy mistook him for a creepy stalker. Desperate, Paul decided to ram into her car, but the aggressive move only scared her more, causing her to make a sharp turn and disappear. Paul searched the area but couldn't find Marcy's car again. Marcy didn't expect her pursuer to be well-intentioned, and once the misunderstanding was cleared, she let her guard down and changed her attitude. However, Paul was still puzzled about the figure in her back seat. Marcy quickly ended the conversation, moving closer with a tender look in her eyes. Just when Paul thought something was about to happen, Marcy pulled out a syringe and stabbed it into his neck. To her surprise, Paul didn't immediately pass out, but instead grabbed her throat in anger. As Marcy was about to suffocate, her husband suddenly appeared and knocked Paul out, revealing that he had been secretly protecting his wife. He even reminded Marcy to use faster-acting drugs next time, making it clear that the couple had some questionable dealings. When they returned home, Marcy's husband expressed his disappointment and planned to move out early the next morning. He told Marcy he could only help her one last time that day. Marcy remained silent, as if she had something more pressing to do. In the blink of an eye, she went to the basement of their house to find Paul tied to a chair, surrounded by strange tools. At this point, Marcy no longer hid her true self. She was the real serial killer, luring unsuspecting men into her car before drugging them and bringing them to her basement. The figure in Marcy's back seat the previous night was not a killer, but a victim. When Marcy saw Paul chasing her, she was worried, not for her own safety, but for fear that the victim in her back seat would be discovered. Little did Paul know that he would end up in the hands of Marcy, who killed randomly for pleasure. It turned out that since high school, Marcy had been ridiculed because of a scar on her face. This eventually twisted her psyche, causing her to seek revenge on strangers. Marcy was fortunate to have a husband who understood her and helped clean up after her violent acts. 
As Marcy prepared to take the final step, she suddenly realized the importance of her husband, who would be leaving the next day. She put down the knife, left the basement, and found her husband packing his bags. She told him she couldn't live without him and decided to share the best things in the world with him. The scene then shifts to Marcy's best friend, tied to a chair and looking terrified, screaming for help in a chicken voice. Surprisingly, Marcy's husband is also involved in the deadly game. As it turns out, this was Marcy's idea of the best sharing. The fifth story, titled Milkmaids, begins in 18th century England, where the smallpox virus plagued the whole country and nearly every household had lost someone to the virus. The man Thomas saw his two children and wife succumb to the virus one after another. One day, he took his remaining child to the church to attend his late wife's funeral, but halfway through the ceremony, the church doors burst open and a young woman stormed in, furiously cursing the pastor. She accused him of being the cause of everyone's demise, a hypocritical man of God. Just a day before, the pastor, unable to bear his loneliness, had secretly sought the company of a local prostitute named Celeste. However, when the pastor noticed red rashes on Celeste's body, he panicked and tried to leave. This angered Celeste. Although she had rashes, they were not the dreaded smallpox virus. Moreover, men who had come into contact with Celeste's rashes would never contract smallpox again. This news had already spread throughout the village. Shocked, the pastor foolishly believed it and even licked the fluid oozing from Celeste's rash. He quickly spat it out, feeling nauseous, and cursed Celeste as a witch who deceived people. As he left, he warned her if she dared to reveal what happened, there would be consequences. But Celeste was stubborn, and the next day, exposed the pastor's hypocrisy in front of everyone. At that moment, the pastor feigned righteousness, not only condemning Celeste as a courtesan, but also accusing her of bringing the smallpox virus. The congregation, who had initially obeyed the pastor, became furious after being misled and began to beat Celeste, wishing to kill her. The pastor even planned to tie her up, but Thomas stepped in to stop him. He didn't want Celeste's intrusion to disrupt his wife's funeral. The chaotic scene finally began to subside. After the crowd dispersed, Thomas approached the pastor privately to apologize for the public disrespect. He then mentioned a rumor from a nearby town that people had dug up the graves of smallpox victims and discovered that the bodies buried for months hadn't decayed. The villagers burned the deceased's hearts, and as a result, smallpox never surfaced in the town again. The pastor thought this was a fabricated lie, but Thomas wanted to try extracting his wife's heart. He couldn't risk his only child being infected with smallpox. The pastor began to consider his proposal. Little did they know, their conversation was overheard by Thomas's son, Edward. The two men seemed mad, wanting to dig up the deceased's hearts to prevent the spread of the virus. The pastor, after solemnly performing prayers, quickly pulled out a dagger and extracted a bloody heart. Believing that consuming the heart would provide immunity against the virus, the pastor stuffed it in his mouth and chewed. He didn't forget to save a share for Thomas. The scene shifts to Thomas and Edward having dinner together. The father urges the boy to finish his plate, claiming it will ensure good health. Edward knew what the food on his plate was, but couldn't disobey his father. As he struggled with his decision, there was a knock at the door. Delilah, their milkmaid, had come to deliver milk. Edward seized the opportunity to feed his food to the cat under the table. After clearing his plate, he wasn't grateful for Delilah's arrival because the pastor had said that milkmaids being around livestock were unclean. This was a common prejudice at the time. Delilah was actually a very intelligent and kind girl. Upon returning to the cowshed, she discovered the injured Celeste, the woman who had fled the church earlier. Delilah let her stay and rest in her bedroom. Celeste admitted she had also been a milkmaid, reassuring Delilah that their work wasn't shameful. When Delilah learned that the pastor had attacked Celeste, she wasn't afraid but comforted Celeste, urging her to heal before leaving. For the first time in years, Celeste felt cared for, her heart at ease. The next morning, Thomas's wife was buried. Oddly, both Thomas and Edward remained calm, not shedding a single tear. The composed pastor approached them, claiming he'd never felt healthier. Thomas understood the implication and quickly sent Edward away. However, the pastor pulled out another fresh heart, this one from a recently deceased person. He seemed to be obsessed with consuming hearts and even planned to share this remedy with the villagers, protecting them from smallpox. Thomas knew the pastor's motive was to involve the villagers in his actions, making it easier for him to escape blame. But Thomas couldn't change anything because that afternoon, the pastor publicly announced his smallpox prevention method at the church. The villagers were excited, believing that digging up graves was a small price to pay for stopping the spread of smallpox. 
In the cow shed, Celeste noticed that the red rash on her body seemed to be increasing. She became a bit flustered. Coincidentally, Delilah walked by and saw her, thinking that Celeste had contracted smallpox. Delilah tried to stay calm and advised her to isolate herself immediately. Celeste explained that it was all a misunderstanding and proceeded to share a long hidden story from her past. As it turned out, the red rash on Celeste's body had developed when she worked as a milkmaid. She had successfully concealed it at the time and no one had discovered it. Celeste had even fallen in love with a man and had a child with him. It wasn't until her rash was discovered that she was expelled from the estate. Later, forced to make a living, she became a woman of ill repute. However, Celeste soon realized that men who had come into contact with her rash never contracted smallpox again. She proudly believed it was a gift from God. But after hearing Celeste's story, Delilah was shocked. This was no divine power. It was clearly an antibody against the smallpox virus. If it could be extracted and replicated, many more people could be saved. So she began to search through her knowledge resources. As evening approached, the villagers seemed to have gone mad. Each of them grabbed a hoe and headed to the village graveyard. After the pastor announced that the treatment had begun, everyone started digging up graves. The foolish villagers firmly believed that by extracting the hearts from the corpses, they could ward off the terrifying smallpox. Meanwhile, Delilah found a few blood stains in a glass of freshly squeezed milk. She knew it had come from the cow and immediately went to the cow shed to investigate. As expected, she discovered a rash similar to Celeste's on the cow's body. However, this wasn't the smallpox virus, but a weaker cowpox virus. Delilah instantly guessed the key to the problem. Celeste had once contracted cowpox while milking cows, which had incidentally increased her resistance to smallpox. Before long, there were several bottles of cowpox-contaminated milk on the table. Delilah firmly believed that they could help the villagers fend off the dreadful smallpox virus. She instructed Celeste to continue milking and not to stop. She first delivered the milk to the villagers to consume, with her employer's house being the first stop. Upon learning from Edward that Thomas and the villagers had gone to dig up graves, Delilah cursed their stupidity. She then forcefully made Edward drink the antibody-laden milk. Afterward, she hurriedly went to the graveyard and tried to stop everyone from digging up the graves. But the villagers were frenzied and wouldn't listen to her bullshit. At that moment, the pastor appeared and scolded Delilah for spouting nonsense. Delilah suddenly remembered that the pastor's health had also benefited from Celeste, as had most of the men in the village who had been spared from the smallpox virus. This realization made the pastor even angrier, and he picked up a rock and knocked Delilah unconscious. He then quickly headed toward the cow shed. Thomas knew the pastor was up to no good and rushed to stop him. Seeing the pastor determined to act recklessly, Thomas had no choice but to admit that Celeste was actually the biological mother of his son, Edward. He had once abandoned her, and now he vowed not to let her get hurt again. At this point, the pastor had clearly lost his sanity and stabbed Thomas to the ground. After entering the room, he saw Celeste, and instead of hurting her, he planned to assault her again. Luckily, Delilah arrived just in time to stab the pastor from behind, and Celeste seized the opportunity to finish him off, sending the pastor to meet Jesus. The two survivors embraced, but to their surprise, the injured Thomas also arrived in the cow shed. He saw his former lover in such an intimate moment with another woman and furious, cursed and swung his knife at Celeste. Delilah once again stepped in to protect Celeste, taking the blow. Delilah soon stopped breathing. Enraged, Celeste knocked Thomas unconscious with a shovel. At this point, she was ready to put everything on the line. She set the cowshed ablaze, burning all the evil within to ashes. Celeste was determined to leave the village with a cow infected with cowpox. But before doing so, she had to take her biological son Edward with her. The boy seemed to have been born without the ability to express his emotions. He showed no sadness upon hearing of his father's death, nor joy upon learning that the woman before him was his mother. But when Celeste hugged Edward, the boy suddenly stabbed her in the body because he believed that milkmaids were considered unclean beings. The sixth story, titled Bloody Mary, begins with four high school dorm roommates who recently heard rumors about Bloody Mary and found it intriguing. It's said that if the summoning is successful, any wish can be granted. However, if it fails, the summoner's eyes will be gouged out. The four girls don't take the taboo seriously, thinking it's just a spooky game. They gather in front of the mirror, light a candle, and chant Bloody Mary. The most rational one, Bianca, interrupts the ritual, believing they should show reverence. Her sister, Elise, thinks Bianca is ruining everyone's fun. 
Worried about losing her friends, Bianca conquers her fear and agrees to play the game again. To avoid further dampened spirits, they decide to perform the ritual separately. Each girl returns to her room, lights a candle in front of the mirror, and chants Bloody Mary three times. After the third chant, all the candles are extinguished. A figure appears in the shattered mirror, and the girls tremble in fear, wetting their pants. They never expected the legend to be true. Fortunately, instead of taking their eyes, the figure whispers something in their ears. Suddenly, there's a piercing scream. All the girls rush out except for the braided girl. They quickly head to her room, but when they turn on the light, she's unharmed. They are confused and can't explain their experience, especially since they all saw Bloody Mary in the mirror and received different hints. Bianca's greatest wish is to attend Yale University, and Bloody Mary says she can achieve this by accusing her teacher of harassment. The other girls also learn shortcuts to their dreams, but Elise refuses to disclose her hint. She believes Bloody Mary is a witch trying to lure them into criminal acts. The others panic, fearing the witch's retaliation if they don't follow her instructions. The braided girl's hallucination may have been a warning. Elise calms everyone down, suggesting they wait and see. Elise and Bianca have a unique family situation because their mother, who remarried, has always ignored them. They'd rather spend the night in a car than return home. The next morning, when the four roommates attend class, the teacher lectures on light reflection, and a large, shiny mirror appears. The girls' eyes widen as Bloody Mary reappears, and they scream and flee the classroom. They've stirred up significant trouble, and Bloody Mary appears wherever there's a mirror. The chubby girl is the first to give in, wanting to follow Mary's instructions to avoid punishment and fulfill her wish. Elise is the first to object, insisting there must be a way to rid themselves of Bloody Mary. That afternoon, Bianca was discussing her application to Yale University with her tutor. The tutor, however, didn't think she had much of a chance. The university was known for catering to wealthy kids, and even though Bianca was a straight-A student, she could only hope to gain sympathy from society by playing up her hardships. This advice was strikingly similar to Bloody Mary's hint. Bianca became uneasy and left the office in a hurry. The braided girl faced a similar dilemma. Seeing her ex-boyfriend cozying up with another girl, she remembered Bloody Mary's suggestion. To get back together with her ex, she had to find and share some indecent photos of his current girlfriend online. The chubby girl couldn't escape the entanglement either. She was the first to break down, deciding to follow Bloody Mary's advice as it promised both survival and wish fulfillment. The other friends were worried and followed her to the indoor basketball court. The chubby girl's greatest wish was to become the captain of the cheerleading team. Bloody Mary told her that to achieve this, she must cause an accident that would paralyze the current captain, and the human pyramid during practice was the perfect opportunity. Elise, in a state of panic, yelled at her not to do anything foolish. The chubby girl hesitated, and at the last moment caught the captain as she fell. The chubby girl fled the basketball court with mixed emotions. After this incident, Elise and Bianca believed that Bloody Mary could be defeated. Bianca even covered all the mirrors in her bedroom. However, at midnight, the white cloth covering the mirrors mysteriously fell off, and Bloody Mary appeared once more. She urged Bianca to complete the task by midnight the next day. Terrified, Bianca ran outside and only felt at ease when she saw her sister Elise returning home from work. Just then, the panic-stricken braided girl approached them, saying that the chubby girl had suffered an accident at home, with both her eyes gouged out. The police attributed it to a homeless man who had broken in, but the three girls knew what the real cause was. Bianca feared that Bloody Mary would come for her the next night. Elise went to the library first thing the next morning to research everything she could find about Bloody Mary. Surprisingly, there was a real person with that name in history who once lived in a wooden house rumored to be cursed. Afterward, Elise followed the clues to a historical museum where detailed records of the legends surrounding the wooden cabin could be found. The cabin was once used as a hiding place for runaway slaves. The owner not only provided food and drink to the escaped slaves, but also hid them in the basement to evade capture by the wealthy. The slaves eventually discovered that they were being held captive in the basement, and the owner was later found stabbed to death by an unknown assailant. A dagger was found nearby, but was quickly locked away in a display case. As Elise desperately sought a way to retrieve the dagger, her friends had already given up. The braided girl had hacked into her ex-boyfriend's private photo album and downloaded a large number of private photos and videos. She was about to follow Bloody Mary's advice and upload them to a public forum when Bianca stopped her, warning that it would ruin an innocent girl's reputation. Furious, the braided girl left, but with no other choice, she couldn't bring herself to do such a despicable act. 
That afternoon, she mysteriously disappeared. Bianca and Elise tried calling her, but there was no answer. They went to her house, only to find her dead in her bed. With the deaths of two friends, the sisters became more determined to defeat Bloody Mary. Led by Elise, they returned to the museum. As Bianca distracted the curator, Elise stealthily obtained the key to the display case and stole the dagger that had killed the cabin owner. Elise believed that Bloody Mary's power came from the wooden cabin, and by killing her with the same dagger, everything would return to normal. After a day's journey, the sisters finally neared their destination. The abundance of mirrors around them sent shivers down their spines. They searched the cabin but couldn't find Bloody Mary, so they lit a candle and called her name three times in front of a mirror. As expected, Bloody Mary appeared. Bianca urged Elise to stab her, but Elise didn't move. It turned out that when Elise first summoned Bloody Mary, they had struck a deal. Bloody Mary would grant Elise endless wealth, and Elise would bring her the dagger and the blood of three innocent people as an offering. Bianca realized that their friends had not been killed by Bloody Mary, but by Elise. With two samples of blood already collected, the third was meant to be her own. Panicking, Bianca ran for her shitty life and hid behind a tree under the cover of darkness, but Elise eventually found her. When Bianca woke up, she caught Elise preparing to stab her. Desperate, Bianca grabbed the dagger and, in a swift move, managed to kill her sister instead. Bianca was devastated, never having intended to kill Elise. However, Bloody Mary smiled, for the three samples of blood she sought had been gathered. Subsequently, Bloody Mary revealed her true origins. In the beginning, a large number of slaves were imprisoned in the basement of the wooden cabin. The slave traders reappeared that they took away a boy, causing his mother to be heartbroken. In desperation, she turned to the gods she had worshipped for years by summoning them through a mirror. To her surprise, a miracle occurred. The mother was imbued with divine power and swiftly killed the slave traders on the scene. She then picked up a dagger and stabbed the cabin owner to death in a fit of insanity, even killing a kind-hearted person who tried to stop her. As punishment, the gods imprisoned the mother in a mirror forever, where she could observe the truths of the world. This was the real origin of the Bloody Mary legend, which had nothing to do with the cabin owner. Only the dagger and the blood of three innocent people could set her free. At this point, Bianca was heartbroken, but she decided to help Bloody Mary one more time by offering the blood of three innocent people to the mirror. After Bloody Mary drank the blood, her body slowly emerged from the mirror. However, as she grabbed Bianca, something strange happened. Bloody Mary had regained her true form, but Bianca was trapped inside the mirror. It turned out that to regain her freedom, Bloody Mary needed a substitute. Although Bianca struggled, she was powerless to change her fate. The only way to escape was to lure innocent people inside the mirror to replace her, just like the previous Bloody Mary did. The seventh story, titled Facelift, begins with a beauty expert, Virginia, was awakened by her alarm clock. As usual, she went to the bathroom and applied her freshly collected morning urine to her face. This was a skincare method she was currently trying. At this point, her ex-husband's daughter, Faye, appeared, stating that Virginia's actions were ridiculous and tried to stop her stepmother. Virginia was urged not to be so obsessed with aging, but everyone knew she wouldn't listen. Later, Virginia went to the window and accidentally saw her handsome neighbor. Faye noticed her stepmother's intentions and encouraged her to take a courageous step and greet the neighbor. After all, she had heard that her neighbor might be getting a divorce soon. Before leaving, Faye told Virginia that the neighbor would go to a store every Friday to buy alcohol. This information stirred Virginia's heart and filled her with excitement. So she headed to the store to stake out the handsome guy, and as expected, her neighbor showed up. Virginia hurriedly approached and started to put on an act. Upon hearing that the neighbor and his lover had separated, she couldn't help but feel delighted. However, at that moment, the neighbor's new girlfriend, Cassie, suddenly appeared. After the neighbor introduced them to each other, Cassie claimed that she knew Virginia. They had both lived in the same dormitory building during college. Virginia, not surprised, showed more disappointment than anything and awkwardly said it's time for her to leave. Just then, the neighbor mentioned he needed to grab some wine. Virginia quickly asked Cassie how she managed to maintain her good looks after all these years. After receiving a perfunctory reply, Cassie sternly told Virginia to stay away from her muscular boyfriend. She had seen right through Virginia's intentions. After Virginia backed down, Cassie handed her a business card. Following the information on the card, Virginia arrived at a plastic surgery clinic. After explaining her intentions, the doctor refused her. He then shared some cliched words of wisdom. Virginia stopped the doctor, but this time she dropped her arrogant attitude and shared her inner pain and loneliness. The doctor's demeanor changed, admitting that he was not a plastic surgeon but a devotee who worshipped beauty. 
His work was simply to restore those beautiful things. The doctor conducted some tests on Virginia and explained the comprehensive transformation process, which involved innovative techniques. He emphasized that no one could do it as well as they could, but the methods were a closely guarded secret. After the examination, Virginia noticed before and after photos of previous clients on the wall. The drastic changes were hard for her to believe. Before leaving, the doctor provided a price list for the procedures. Judging by Virginia's expression, the cost was not cheap. She immediately contacted her account manager who tried to dissuade her, stating that based on their current financial situation, they couldn't afford such a large sum. But Virginia was still determined to go through with it. One evening, Virginia was alone doing her skincare routine when she suddenly heard noises from next door. She approached the window and saw her neighbor flirting with his new girlfriend. Cassie, noticing Virginia spying on them like a peeping Tom, provocatively closed the curtains. The following day, Virginia went to the clinic with a check in hand and signed the agreement for her treatments. The doctor noticed that Virginia had beautiful hands and suggested that she should get her hands done as well, at no extra cost. Virginia gladly accepted the offer. Together, they went to the operating room. After the assistant administered anesthesia to Virginia, the doctor and assistant began chanting strange incantations. That night, Faye returned home to find her mother's head and hands wrapped in bandages. Faye quickly gave her mother some painkillers and informed her that their financial situation was dire and Faye's tuition might be affected. Virginia, in pain and agitated, snapped at her daughter, telling her to apply for a student loan and even saying that Faye wasn't her biological child. Faye stormed off, feeling hurt by her mother's words. A while later, possibly due to the painkillers, Virginia started hallucinating. Strange scenes and sounds appeared, but fortunately, Faye came back to stay with her mother. The next day, after giving Virginia her medication, Faye explained that she had thought about an incident from her childhood that made her realize everyone has their own thoughts and feelings. She had been rebellious, sporting an avant-garde hairstyle that upset her father and birth mother, and had broken a family heirloom necklace in anger. Faye acknowledged that Virginia had always treated her well, never making her feel unhappy due to not being her biological daughter. She wanted to help Virginia, so she came back. Faye then expressed her confusion about why Virginia's bandages were so extensive for a regular plastic surgery procedure. Virginia went back to the clinic to ask the doctor about her daughter's concerns. After a cursory examination, the doctor assured her that everything was fine and that her recovery was just a bit slow. However, the doctor suddenly suggested that Faye's presence might not be good for Virginia's recovery and could have a negative influence. The doctor recommended that Virginia change her environment for healing, offering her own exclusive resort as a place to stay. There would be weekend parties and many plastic surgeons available to help her. Virginia happily accepted the offer and went home to pack her things, while Faye tried her best to persuade her mother otherwise, but to no avail. And so, Virginia arrived at the place recommended by the doctor. As soon as she entered, she found herself facing many people. With her face wrapped in bandages, she felt a bit embarrassed. But after the doctor's comforting words, she relaxed. After a cursory examination of Virginia, the doctor suddenly announced that they could remove the bandages that very night. She suggested that Virginia do it in front of everyone, as they were all like family. Virginia gladly accepted once again. Meanwhile, Faye, who had been hiding in the trunk of her mother's car, also arrived at the place. However, just as she was about to find Virginia, she was suddenly caught by security and knocked unconscious. That evening, during the party, the doctor delivered her usual motivational speech to everyone. She then invited Virginia on stage and said that before removing the bandages, there was one more thing to take care of. On the other side, security brought the captured Faye to the scene. The doctor immediately asked Virginia if she knew her daughter had come here. Virginia denied it, and when Faye cried out mother, Virginia quickly stated that she was not Faye's biological mother. The staff then took Faye away. The doctor slowly helped Virginia remove the bandages and handed her a mirror. Virginia suddenly saw her own face in the mirror, ugly as a pig and her deformed hands. Unable to comprehend the situation, she didn't know what to do. The doctor then revealed that Virginia was to be a sacrifice. It turned out that they performed a ceremony like this every year, where beautiful people would kill those as ugly as pigs. The sea was just a few kilometers away, and if Virginia could escape to it, she would be free. As the doctor spoke, the participants picked up their weapons. Seeing this, Virginia didn't hesitate and immediately started running. However, before long, she saw her neighbor. Although Virginia begged her neighbor for help, he still pulled out a weapon. Everyone else also arrived at the scene and brutally killed Virginia. Just then, Faye was brought to the scene. As she mourned her mother's tragic death, the doctor revealed the truth. 
Faye's birth mother had been one of their members, and Virginia was just a gift sent to Faye from her birth mother. Faye suddenly remembered the necklace she had broken during her rebellious phase. It bore the logo of this organization. At that moment, Faye finally understood everything. A few days later, Faye was approached by a boy at school who complimented her tattoo. Now more composed and confident, Faye engaged in conversation with him. Afterward, she noticed a similar tattoo on the boy's arm. Together, they headed to a classroom at their school. The eighth story, titled Necro, begins with a girl named Sam, who is a skilled mortician working in a funeral home in California. Thanks to her meticulous care for the deceased, she is highly favored by the funeral home's management. However, her relationship with her boyfriend is not going well. Although the boy loves her, he is always bothered by the smell of formaldehyde lingering on her due to her job. This prevents them from getting closer, even when the hormone feelings are there. Sam often complains about this problem to her friends. Deep down, she knows her boyfriend doesn't like her job. But when her friends ask her to choose between her job and her boyfriend, Sam hesitates. It seems that she loves her work more, and she talks about it passionately. She has learned a lot from working with the deceased, such as the gas inside a corpse that can cause a snoring sound when released through the mouth, or how some corpses' lower bodies become more rigid due to blood flow issues. What makes her happiest is the belief that her work brings the deceased's friends and family back to their side, even if it's only for a short time during the funeral. Sam's fascination with death seems to be a unique preference. The next day, Sam carries on her usual routine. During her work, a young man suddenly enters. He introduces himself as Charlie, the new corpse transporter. After placing the corpse down, he whispers something in the corpse's ear and leaves immediately. This catches the attention of Sam, who also has a strong connection with the deceased. In a later conversation between Sam and Charlie, we learn that Charlie was expressing his gratitude to the deceased for allowing him to transport their body. Charlie believes it's a sacred honor, which makes Sam feel an instant fondness for him. When Sam returns home and takes a thorough shower, she finally has an intimate moment with her boyfriend after a long time. However, during their hormone yoga session, Charlie's image keeps flashing in Sam's mind. In the following days, Sam and Charlie spend their time at work discussing various local practices for handling the deceased. They explore the different rituals and customs associated with different religions. This shared interest quickly brings them closer. After a few days, Charlie opens up to Sam about his past. He and his family were separated by a tragic car accident, and his survival made him realize the preciousness of life. So he decided to live bravely for his family and find his true self. Just as Sam is about to share her story, her boyfriend suddenly calls. It turns out that Sam forgot about a dinner appointment with her boyfriend's parents because she was engrossed in her conversation with Charlie. She quickly hangs up and heads home, only to find the house in complete darkness. Strange noises lead her to the kitchen, where scattered food on the floor brings back memories of a home invasion from her childhood, during which her mother was brutally murdered. Seeing Sam's emotional breakdown, her boyfriend quickly turns on the lights. It turns out he had planned a surprise for her and wanted to propose. However, the surprise turned into a scare. The cereal that her boyfriend thought Sam loved was the same cereal that had been scattered on the floor during her mother's murder. To honor her mother's memory, Sam had kept the cereal as a memento. Overcome with emotion, Sam rejects her boyfriend's proposal, telling him he should find a normal girl. She then storms out of the house. A few days later, while at work, Sam receives a deceased person. As she slowly uncovers the body, she is shocked to discover that it is her co-worker Charlie. Grief floods her mind, and she mourns the loss of her like-minded friend. She weeps over Charlie's body, expressing her sorrow and lamenting her return to a lonely state. Gradually, she begins to kiss Charlie's hand and sits on top of him, starting a hormone yoga session with the dead. But suddenly, Charlie's hand moves, jolting Sam back to reality. She rushes out of the room to calm herself, but when she returns, Charlie's body has disappeared. Sam realizes this must be a prank by Charlie. She runs to his house and finds him alive and well. Faced with Sam's anger, Charlie explains that his apparent death was due to medication that stopped his breathing. The cuts on his body were fake, created by a friend skilled in makeup. He claims that he did all this to help Sam truly understand herself. However, an outraged Sam refuses to accept this explanation. She insists that she was just mentally disoriented at that moment and chooses to leave. Two months later, Sam found a new job and was about to get married to her boyfriend. However, thoughts of Charlie would still occasionally flash through her mind. Before the wedding, Sam's close friends expressed their concerns, feeling that Sam didn't truly want this marriage. Ever since she quitted her job at the funeral home, Sam seemed like a different person. 
The old Sam would never have enjoyed such a mundane life, but the new Sam insisted that this was the life she wanted, and her boyfriend was the one who could give it to her. The scene shifts to Sam's wedding. After they both exchange vows, her boyfriend presents a video montage of their life together. Suddenly, the video starts showing footage of Sam's intimate interactions with a corpse at the funeral home. Everyone at the wedding is shocked. At this moment, Charlie appears, accusing the boyfriend of stifling Sam's adventurous spirit and confessing his love for her. It turns out that this was part of Charlie's well-prepared plan to disrupt the wedding. Faced with the damning video evidence, Sam's boyfriend angrily leaves, and Sam rejects Charlie's sudden declaration of love. A few days later, Sam has no choice but to look for a new job. However, because of the scandalous video that is spread widely, she struggles to find work. Even when buying coffee, she's pointed out by strangers, and her former friends keep their distance. Unable to take it anymore, she buys a gun on the black market, determined to take revenge on Charlie for ruining her life. She follows him to a cemetery, slowly approaches him while he's working, and holds the gun to him. The only question she has is why Charlie would destroy her life. Charlie explains that on the day his family died, he had a brush with death and saw the harsh reality of the world. He also knew about Sam's past. After her mother was murdered when she was a child, Sam naively believed her mother was just sleeping. She spent three days with her mother's corpse, all the while continuing to breastfeed. Charlie knew what Sam's true nature was like, so everything he had done was because he loved Sam and wanted to awaken her true humanity. At this point, Sam finally lets her guard down and admits to the three days she spent with her mother's corpse after her death. That was the last time she felt a sense of security and love. The next time she felt this secure was when she faced Charlie's corpse. Now, having truly confronted her own feelings, Sam finally knows what she wants, a life that is both alive and dead. As she raises the gun to end her life, Charlie immediately stops her, promising to do anything for her. His words melt Sam's heart, and she shoots Charlie instead. As Charlie collapses, Sam starts a dirt-moving machine and climbs into a deep pit prepared for a coffin. The two lovers, facing the person they love the most, finally unite. As the soil buries them, they collabs in their final hormone yoga session and journey together to another world. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.